On April 3, 1974, an F5 tornado with wind speeds reaching more than 250 miles per hour hit the city of Xenia. By the time it was over, half of Xenia was gone. 32 people were killed, more than 1,000 were injured. And this was a part of a massive storm system of nearly 150 tornadoes that hit the U.S. that day, which is still one of the largest tornado outbreaks in recorded history. But through tragedy, it also led to life-saving advancements in the understanding of tornadoes and how better to prepare for them. So over the course of the last several months, we have been speaking with survivors, weather experts, and others about what happened that day and what's happened in the 50 years since. Here is the day the clock stopped. Xenia was a, a city that was built up on the hill as you were coming from east, from Dayton. You would, you would drive up 35 and go up the big hill and then enter into a very small town. At least it looked that way. A lot can happen inside of a city over 200 plus years. Homes are built, neighborhoods grow, families and businesses form, and over time an identity is forged. Xenia, Ohio sits nearly equidistant from Columbus and Cincinnati. Founded in 1803, the city is named after the Greek word for hospitality. But for many on the outside, this area is also known for another word, one that by definition conjures up some of the most destructive and heart-wrenching parts of nature. Xenia is a city that I think for any, any meteorologist growing up, they think horrible tornado, they think about, about Xenia and the impacts there from the super outbreak. It was such a frightening moment for me that I can honestly say I cannot remember what I saw. All I knew was fear. I was scared, sure, but I knew that mom and God was protecting us because we were praying loud <laughs> at the top of our lungs. I don't remember what I was saying, but we were calling. But it was quick. It was, uh, uh, it, it just came and went. And then there was an eerie silence and all of a sudden you could hear people shouting and screaming and sirens and... I thought somebody dropped the bombs. I really did. I thought somebody dropped the bombs. These were tornadoes that were moving 55 miles per hour across the countryside and they were violent. Then the original Fujita scale three, four, five, uh, the homes are just not built to withstand that. It's just one of those events in our lives that plants a deep and impermeable seed in our brains, and it's, it's formative, it's really important. On April 3rd, 1974, the largest outbreak of tornadoes in recorded history at that time began cutting a deadly and destructive path. It stretched from the Gulf Coast to the Great Lakes region. By the time it was over, researchers documented 148 tornadoes, most packing winds reaching 113 miles per hour or higher. One of the most devastating, an F5 with winds reaching greater than 260 miles per hour, hit the small city of Xenia. There's gonna be a tremendous drop in pressure, you'll feel that. The sound will be not like a freight train, the sound will most likely be like a jet engine and a jet taking, over, taking off right over your head. You get a compounding effect, the wind is blowing, the debris from upstream is banging into the buildings as well, shooting like missiles, penetrating through walls, car windows of cars. And um, so it's really a very, very deadly environment. I think it's, it's something folks have described as, as, as unimaginable to the senses, something they never experienced again. Uh, they certainly hope they never experience again, but uh, ama amazingly powerful. This is a surface analysis from about one o'clock in the afternoon on the day of the super outbreak. 20 miles away from Xenia, at the National Weather Service offices in Wilmington, meteorologist Andy Hatsos explains to Dayton 24-7 now Chief Meteorologist Natalie Walters the maps and other tools used to track the super outbreak 50 years ago. The radar technology that was in place back then was developed in the 1950s and they did not have the ability to see the motions, the wind speeds and directions within a storm, what we refer to now as Doppler radar, our ability to see the way storms move and the way that the winds inside them are moving. What meteorologists did have in 1974 was an understanding of the shape of supercell thunderstorms on radar. Those are what produce tornadoes. They also knew a hook echo 
indicated it was a tornado producing supercell. And this radar image is from 4.51 p.m. on the day of the super outbreak, and the meteorologists at the Cincinnati Covington National Weather Service office were indicating, for one, the supercell thunderstorm with, you see the little hook, the little hook echo right there as the tornado was exiting Xenia, basically right after it had hit the city. At the Greene County, Ohio Historical Society, the Xenia tornado looms large. Catherine Wilson is the executive director. She was nine years old when the storm hit. Wilson says she was inside her home at the Arrowhead subdivision, a housing development with few basements. Most homes were built on concrete slabs. Then we watched the weather toward the north because their storm was kind of that way. It was a bluish black color, the sky was, and the lightning was staying down a little bit longer than normal. So we said, OK, let's go out, look out the front because that's where the weather comes from. So then we saw a big gray cloud, kind of boiling cloud. Wilson alerted her mom, who then quickly brought her and her younger sister to an interior bathroom. So we took off our glasses. Mom and I were wearing glasses at the time. And we took them off, and she laid over top of us to protect us. And then it hit a few streets over. Then five-year-old Jeff Lauterbach was getting ready to sit down for dinner with his parents. It was around 4.30. When we sat down to eat, it started getting darker. And, and uh, at the time, there were no warning systems. So we sat down to eat, and I remember looking out the window, and you could see the darkness, and you could see stuff blowing around. It was at that moment his parents, Rebecca and Dale Lauterbach, got an ominous phone call from a neighbor. The day of the tornado, uh, our uh, neighbor, he was a police officer, Frank Pelly, Miamiansburg Police, uh, he told us to get in, lay in the hallway, because a tornado was coming. Across town, then 18-year-old Maureen Clark was staying late at Xenia High School. She was in the school's auditorium with several other students. They were practicing for their upcoming musical, The Boyfriend. All of a sudden, this young lady, Ruth Benuti, I have to say her name, um, she was a band member and she knew that she had friends in the high school who were practicing for the musical. And she and her mom were in the car coming home from errands and they saw the tornado coming. Oh, so they weren't even at the school? They time. weren't, they no. They just stopped at the school. They to... stopped to come in to tell us that it was right there coming. Clark says she and her classmates went to look outside and that's when they saw it, closing in fast. The tornado was either hitting Detroit Street at that time or Shawnee Park, which was right across the street. It was such a frightening moment for me that I can honestly say I cannot remember what I saw. All I knew was fear. But we all got down on the floor, put our heads towards the wall, did all the right things, not knowing it was the right thing to do. Some of us were praying, some of them were really angry and screaming and afraid, and then all of a sudden, it hit. In another part of town, then 18-year-old Randy Dice was visiting his girlfriend. My sister was right across the street at the time, but I didn't know it. And uh, she was at the grocery store at Kennedy's, and I was on California Street behind, behind the grocery store, and uh, the trash can started just banging together, just banging. I mean, like, you know, somebody just picked them up. And her mom goes, I think that's a tornado. We didn't have much time. Uh, got it. I remember getting in the hallway, laying down. My mom laid on top of me. My dad uh, laid on top of my mom. And I remember my dad praying. It was really loud, just as you hear the, the concept of a freight train. Ear, just really loud, right? kind of a deep sound to me, not a, ear piercing, but very, very loud. It was more like a jet engine because Dad was an aircraft mechanic. It sounded like a big indrawn breath, like <gasps> with that, that <sighs> it was like an indrawn breath and an outgoing breath at the same time. And then came just everything broke at that point, I think and glass was flying and shards of whatever 
hit hit us in the arms and as the wind came with that all that those shards of building um, we were pushed together like an accordion and it just lifted us a little bit off the floor and we were all just kind of scrunched together and then dropped back down to the floor and when it hit it, all the glass in the windows was broken and it was crashing against the walls and all the doors of the bedrooms and the closets and everything that were open slammed shut because of the pressure the wind pressure air pressure and then all of a sudden you just heard the house explode essentially glass shatter um, i remember looking from under my mom and dad looking seeing the doors being ripped off and the walls collapsing of course we prayed yeah and uh prayed and uh, yeah, we answered our prayers that day. You know what I'm saying? I heard it, and we flipped the couch over top of us. We just laid there until we couldn't couldn't hear any more noise. Okay, then we uh, we got up, and that's when I opened the door. And there was uh, two-story houses across the street, and I all I seen was pipes, pipes, no walls, no roof, just pipes. All this lumber and house roofs and insulation everywhere. You just kind of stand there with your mouth open. There was no second story left to the main part of the building at all. That was our ceiling. And um, so thankfully it didn't take more because we were underneath that part. The auditorium where Clark and her classmates had been moments earlier had imploded. The relentless winds throwing two school buses on the very stage where she and others were practicing moments before the storm hit. So this display over here. At the Greene County Historical Society, there's a clock pulled from the rubble of the high school. It's face forever frozen at 4.39 p.m. A reminder of the exact moment the tornado hit. A reminder of when everything changed. I do know um, God was with us. We were protected and um, we didn't die in that auditorium. In just minutes, half of Xenia was gone. The Arrowhead subdivision, where Wilson and Lauderback lived, was leveled. Hundreds of families throughout the city no longer had a home to go back to, and the homes of thousands more were barely recognizable. Most of the downtown was heavily damaged or destroyed. Communication was impossible. Landlines were down. There was no internet or cell phones, no way to connect with loved ones. As she emerged from a now decimated Xenia High School, it would take Maureen Clark several hours before she found her way home. And my mom was standing outside and I, she was looking the other way and I can just remember walking and walking faster and then finally <laughs> running and mom, mom, I'm here. And that was probably around seven or eight o'clock that evening. There are many stories from that day of tearful reunions and near misses. There are also plenty of haunting ones too. Like the one Wilson's father told her happened to him. As a member of the National Guard, he helped after the storm hit. Well, there was one night he was on anti-looting duty and he was over in one of the residential areas. I'm not sure which one. I'm not sure which, you know, which street or anything. But it's 2, 2.30 in the morning, and he's out there by himself, and all this devastation around him. There's a house with one wall standing 
on that wall is a phone. The phone rings. You automatically think, the phone's ringing, let's go answer it. So he went up and answered it, and it was someone from out west wanting to know about their family. So dad's standing there with the phone in his hand next to a wall. No one else in, <laughs> no one else in the neighborhood is around. What do you do? On top of the more than 1,000 people injured in Xenia from the storm, 32 people were killed. Their ages ranged from four weeks to 82 years old. Many of them were children. Their stories all captured in this heartbreaking article written several weeks after the tragedy. Joyce Benkin was 22 and eight months pregnant when the tornado hit the home she shared with her husband in the Windsor Park neighborhood. She and her unborn baby were killed. Her husband survived. The Graham family did what they were supposed to do when a tornado strikes. The family of six went into their basement, but their home, the home next door, and debris from a nearby gas station crashed on top of them. Three of the Graham's four young children didn't make it. Gloria Chambers was 26. Her son, William Armstrong, was seven. The tornado hit their home and so many others in the Arrowhead subdivision. I think about that with all the research I've done over the years, you know, those were kids I probably would have known and gone to school with, those kids that were killed in the tornado. And it could have been us if uh, the tornado was shifted over. Two National Guardsmen were also killed days later when a fire tore through a furniture store they were guarding from looters. A weary community began the enormous task of cleanup and rebuilding. Then President Richard Nixon made a surprise visit on April 9th. The New York Times reported he said this was the worst devastation he'd ever seen. Nixon met with city and county leaders. He also spoke with relief workers. He promised federal aid was coming to help, and he urged the crowds to keep their spirits up. The Times quotes him as saying, quote, This town is not going to die. This town is going to live as long as it's got spirit. And through these dark times, Xenians found it, rallying around the slogan, Xenia lives. Xenia is known as the city of hospitality. And I will honestly say those years after 1974, it really, they really, it was shining. It was really amazing to see that. People do come together at a time like that. And you, know, you see it over and over again. While Xenia started to pick up the pieces, a group of researchers led by University of Chicago professor Ted Fujita began to piece together the puzzle of one of nature's most unforgiving forces. Fujita, nicknamed Mr. Tornado, was already one of the world's leading experts. So many of the building blocks of how we understand how thunderstorms work and how tornadoes work, things that in 2024 you might take for granted, they didn't develop out of nothing. And the work that Dr. Ted Fujita did, um, especially with the super outbreak, an event he is completely tied to because of all the work he did on it, they, that work forms the basis for how we understand supercell thunderstorms, how we understand the way tornadoes work, how we understand downbursts, which is another way that you can get significant damage out of severe thunderstorms. By the time of the Xenia tornado, the Fujita scale, created by Ted Fujita, was already being used to measure tornado intensity. According to the scale, an F5 tornado has wind speeds that reach a maximum of 318 miles per hour. Fujita initially rated the Xenia tornado an F6, but later backed off that, saying an F6 tornado was inconceivable. He and his team spent months on the ground and in the air, intensely studying the super outbreak. That team included then-graduate student, Dr. Greg Forbes. Now the uh, Xenia tornado was uh, a bit cone-shaped cone to start out with, and then at some point it became a little bit more transparent, and then there was these more narrow little miniature funnels that were revolving about it. At, at times there were just two, at times I believe there were four. Fujita and his team had figured out the Xenia tornado had multiple vortices, or funnels, revolving around it. That helped explain the damage pattern of powerful tornadoes. So that's why you can get such an incredible difference, an incredible gradient between one house 
that may be almost spared, maybe has a little bit of shingle damage, and the next one across or across the street has uh, been totally blown away, totally crumbled into bits. The work by Fujita and his team, surveying and gaining a better understanding of tornadoes themselves, helped change the future of storm prediction and safety. Uh, without some of those studies, uh, all of the funds needed for going from traditional radar to Doppler radar, uh, you have to have Congress approval. He, a lot of his testimony to Congress was very vital in getting Doppler radar going to be implemented nationally to get next generations of satellite imagery that's so much better today. But he really took us to the next level in terms of understanding the tornado, understanding how to predict tornadoes, and understand how to categorize them and understand um, just how bad their damage was. In the years since April 3rd, 1974, this community has been hit by two more tornadoes, an F2 in 1989, and in 2000, an F4 cut a path through the city. In that storm, one person was killed and more than 100 were hurt. Some have wondered if there's something about this community that makes it more prone to tornadoes. There's nothing in particular about Greene County or about Xenia that makes it more vulnerable than other counties or cities in the same general area. And any, any county or any city in the area is, is just as much a risk to maybe have the next significant tornado occur. But what experts say these storms do highlight is the importance of taking weather warnings seriously and the importance of the advancements made in the years and decades after the 1974 super outbreak. There's an entire generation of meteorologists that, that have come um, and were inspired by the super outbreak because they want to learn about the science and they want to help contribute to scientific advancement and to getting the warnings out to public in the future to keep people safe. Today, there remains solemn but important reminders of that April day. A downtown memorial lists the names of 32 Xenians and two National Guardsmen who died in the tornado. All of them forever etched in this city's heart and its memory. There are also reminders that history can teach us so many things and even an unimaginable horror and loss. It can show us resilience and what a community can overcome together. When things are seemingly going wrong, take the moment to find that compassion within yourself and figure out what you can do to help. And survivors hope others remember the sense of pride this Ohio community had then and continues to have today, that Xenia lives. Well, we want to share this would not be possible without Chief Photographer Lee Furry. He spent countless hours not just shooting this video with his camera and drone, but also in the editing room. And we also want to thank the National Weather Service and Dr. Greg Forbes for all of their time and expertise. Lastly, a big thanks to the Greene County Historical Society, the Ohio National Guard, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and the University of Chicago for their help. Thank you for watching. Good night.